call this meeting to order. The first order of business is that I will uh, put the Education Committee report at the end of the agenda, just to let everybody know uh, we had a, or Amy has been, had a commitment that she wasn't able to change, but she will be here by the end of the meeting. So uh, just to let you know that's taking place. Public comments? Sean Marie, introduce yourself for those that don't know you. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. I am um, Sean Marie Oler. I'm a Bennington resident, and I'm here for public comments, and these are my public comments. So I'm here tonight for a couple reasons. In reading the MAU minutes uh, for both the committee and the regular minutes for the past year plus, I have a few observations I'd like to share. Thank you. In the past five years, the enrollment at MAU has gone from just over 1,000 in 2005 and 2014 to 844 this year. That's 161 less students in five years. I know the loss of 160 students at a high school does not automatically translate to less staff. However, there's a robust staff at the high school, and there have been no changes to graduation requirements for many, many years. <clears throat> The discussion around graduation requirements started well over five years ago, maybe even a decade. The last change was to add a technology credit. And while you have 11 social studies teachers, there are still no requirements for civics and only three years of required history classes to graduate. Ten years ago, this board talked about the requirement for financial literacy, and still there is no <clears throat> requirement. The regular meeting minutes reflect meetings of an average of an hour, um, an hour long, with little discussion of educational outcomes or policy changes. MAU has approxi had approximately a 20 to 1 teacher ratio, and it now has a 13 to 1. This is at the high school, as reported in the FY17 state report. In two years of regular meeting and committee meetings, I see no class size report. In December 2017, there was an agenda item for high school data, but according to the minutes, there was no time and it was to be put on a subsequent agenda, which I could not find. Tonight, in your consent agenda, you have a resignation letter for a guidance counselor whose letter states that she would work point eight or point six to continue. Before you've even accepted her resignation letter, you are hiring three guidance counselors and a guidance certified school adjustment counselor. Mr. Nixon presented this possible position in November 2018 at an MAU Education Committee meeting with the expectation to follow up with a job description and fina financial feasibility at both the Education and Finance Committee. I could find no follow-up. Last week, I asked for the job description of Central, but to date, I have not gotten a response. I was actually told by Nick that I would be getting it soon. Vermont has the lowest state guidelines for guidance counselors <coughs> of, a, of guidance counselors to student ratio in the country. It's 200 to one. The national recommendation is 200 to one, 250 to one. Most of the country is well above the 250 to one. With MAU's 844 student body and eight guidance counselors, MAU's student to guidance ratio is 105.5 to one. That does not include the four school-based clinicians, and the one school psychologist. Eight guidance counselors are listed on the MAU website. I know one is a three-day position. Add to that, the guidance counselors are not responsible for the personalized learning plans. Those are a separate, they, they do not fall under guidance. Now one might say hiring the guidance counselor for point eight is setting a precedent. It is not. There's an English teacher <coughs> who is also a department head who is point eight, and there are teachers who year after year do not teach first block to help with their child care. The guidance counselor who is asking to work point eight is the only counselor who does the dual enrollment vouchers with the state, with CCV and the local colleges, as well as for the adult ed learning center students. I have seen no dual enrollment report noted in any of the minutes, but MAU has always had the high number of dual enrollment students compared to statewide which also lowers MAU's class sizes. The other item that caught my eye at, a, at the October 17, 2018 board meeting, it was reported that on, this is a quote, on 10-22, the head of the education department at Castleton University would be on hand to assess the alternative program at MAU-HS. 
to determine what gaps and overlaps there might be. This is something, unquote, this is something the board has talked about assessing for years and years. So I was curious not to see a report on the visit from the head of the education department at Castleton in a later meeting. I'm almost done, Tim. I read in, the, in last month's meeting minutes that Dave Fredrickson, true to his nature, has not changed a bit in his mantra of getting the good word out. He described a series of recent really positive events at MAU schools, and I won't go on. Um, it's very disappointing to read this as the public information coordinator was hired a year ago, started July 1st, 2018, to do exactly what Mr. Fredrickson described in his last meeting. In closing, I have no expectation for a response. I'm hoping my observations will lead to a more consistent education meeting. The last one was in November, and the last one was in the subsequent school year. And <clears throat> more discussions around education topics at board meetings. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any of the administrators, Steve, or, or um, like make any comment, or we'll try to get hold? No, that's fine. Thank you, Sean Murray. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to bring before this board? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't ask. <laughs> Are there any other uh, public comments? If not, we'll move on then. Finance is the first uh, area of business. Treasurer's report. I'll move it. We have a second. second. Everybody understand what the treasurer's report is? If so, any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Very good. Move on then. Budget status report is for your information. We can move on then to the consent agenda. We need an motion. So move. We have a second. Second. Any discussion on the consent agenda? I've been informed by our uh, uh, fiscal expert that uh, we need to sign the warrants uh, with a quorum of the board present. So it'll be signed around. In the past, we only used to sign it two or three, but we need at least six now. So it'll be coming around. Mick, are you going to pass? Yes. Does the consent agenda include the education committee? No. OK. It's down here, Father. I thought, on here, what do we got? Uh, the uh, addition to the uh, guidance of council mm -hmm. is under the education. Right, right. And that's coming up. I have trouble following some of this online. OK, are there any further Good. questions? Yes? Good. So do I. Leon just asked if the guidance position was under the consent agenda, and the hires are as well as the resignation, just as an FYI. Yeah, well, we had hoped to have the Education Committee Chair here at this meeting, so it's prob that's probably a good point. Why don't we postpone the consent agenda until we've had a chance to go over the education meeting? So that would be at the end. Uh, that would be at yep. the end. Yeah, okay. Yes. It probably, make, probably makes some sense. Okay, we can go down to policies. And Rob? There are two. The, the first is um, fairly straightforward. We've seen it before. Uh, this is essentially complying with the statute. It seems like it's been adopted by uh, all but us and Pownall and the SPSU. So we're looking for a, a motion to adopt. So move. The second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed to abstentions? Very good. We can go down to the next one. And the tobacco prohibition. And, and Leon, I think you I mean, need help from you on this. This is just a, a sort of a clerical correction to have the possession and use of uh, tobacco and tobacco products. Is that correct? With the vaping and all that stuff. Yeah. So but it, cool. it's all it's. That's correct. It's just the, the one technical correction to include the use uh, as part of possession and or use of tobacco. Where, where does where do e-cigarettes fall into that? That's what the, this is. That's what that tobacco sells. Yeah. And, and it just includes that in the general policy then? So e-cigarettes yes. would be considered as a regular tobacco cigarette? It, 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 the, the phrase we use is tobacco substitutes. Right. But yes. Okay. But it's treated covered under this policy. All of the language is in the policy and can give the administrative group the 
for the rights to do the administrative parts of that under the policy. Does anybody have any further questions on that? Is, is this covered by state law? By what law? What do you mean? State law? I thought there was a state law that said you can't smoke on a campus. Who said you're smoking on a campus? Well, we're talking about tobacco prohibition, right? That's right. Well, I thought there was a state law that said you can't smoke at a school we're in. The school got one too. That's what this. Well, I'm wondering why about. we need both if, if the state says you can't. Well, and then pull up the state people. We yeah. have one that doesn't allow this. It's a tobacco free campus. The, uh, the, the state laws are referenced at the, the bottom yeah. of the policy, and I don't have them right in front of us right now. But um, a tobacco policy is required by statute. So okay. that's part of what this that's is. That's what I did. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion on the floor, I think. Did we get that on the floor? I don't think we got one. Richard, no. no. We need a motion then to accept the. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Okay, we can go down to the committee reports, agricultural and food service. Okay, um, the last ag land meeting was held on um, April 1st at the middle school. Um, it was the first meeting of the full committee in a while. Um, over the winter, there was a working group that met and took care of several issues that we didn't feel the entire committee needed to be in on. So several of those things have, have now been moved off our agenda. Um, and are being taken care of in um, smaller groups. Um, we received the soil sample results, and there are a couple people on the committee who are going to evaluate those and decide how to proceed with what needs to be maybe added to the soil um, in order to make sure that everything is growing well. Um, the sustainability teacher went over the production area beds and what will be planted and how everything, how all of the <coughs> space is going to be used, so that that's clear. Um, there are plans, so I'm, I'm not sure if this happened, but on April 11th, two committee members were supposed to visit the CDC and pick up some materials and tools that have been effectively, I guess, donated by the CDC to um, the middle school garden program um, now that there's no farming program at the CDC. So those, those things should be coming um, to the middle school for use. And I guess last thing, there's a family fitness fest on Sunday, May 19th from 1 to 4, and volunteers are needed. So I'm sure they would welcome any um, participation. It's a grant-funded event um, with outdoor activities families can do to stay healthy. There are food, prizes, and more stuff. Um, the food service meeting that was held on March 21st, I actually wasn't able to attend, but Ron filled me in, so if he wants to add anything. Um, Basically, I think summer meals, um, the summer meals program served 3,200 meals last year and it's expected to go up. So there were 16 sites where they served food and that should be expanding to about 25 sites. Um, and I guess last thing, there was a full state audit that was done of the food program in November and they're still waiting on the results, but they, they feel that they did well, so. Very good. Is there, is there any progress on the use? I see that the greenhouse attached to the high school is being used. Is that mm -hmm. part of the agricultural program now, or what, what's the function there? Um, I, it doesn't come up in our meetings because we mostly focus on the middle school, but I know it's being used by independent teachers, and um, I think some, some a special ed program uses. I'm not I'm the, sure. Well, it's nice to see it being used. Yeah, and I hope it, it is being continue. used. I don't know how much, but. Okay. Any, any questions? Okay, very good, thank you. <clears throat> we can go on to negotiations. Nick is here to help us with that somewhere. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so I, I keep this pretty brief. Um, the teacher negotiation team came to a tentative agreement um, with the board at our most recent meeting, which was with the help of a mediator, Ira LaBelle. Um, at the onset of negotiations, it was agreed between both parties that the only item that would be discussed would be salary, given that the school board and the NEA had agreed to uh, negotiate health insurance for the entire state, effective July 1 of 2020. The board and the teachers agreed that it made sense to only negotiate a one-year contract rather than 
negotiate a long-term contract that may be impacted by that health insurance negotiation at the state level. So given that we were negotiating a one-year contract, um, we agreed to keep kind of all language changes off the table and only look at the salary grid and any salary changes. Um, so through the help of the mediator, we came to an agreement of 3.5% uh, uh, total new money, which is inclusive of STEP. Um, so essentially that breaks down to a 1.624% increase uh, with STEP for those that are eligible to receive it. Um, and that is in place for one year. Uh, that's the tentative agreement yet to be ratified. Um, so once ratified, that would hopefully be in place for one year. And then we'd look to negotiate our next contract after that. Very good. Does anybody have any questions of Nick on that? Once again, we'll wait till we get ratification from the teachers before it becomes the board. Then each of the boards will, will hopefully sign it and, and we can move ahead. But uh, thank you to those people that served on that committee. We, do you want to just mention how we're yes. proceeding with the ESP contract? So ESP, um, we were scheduled to meet with the same mediator this Thursday, but in light of settling with the teachers, the decision has been made to move forward with a regular negotiation without the help of a mediator in hopes that this, the uh, tentative agreement on the teacher Dave, side Dave. will hopefully lead to uh, similar progress with ESP and, they, and their group agreed. So there will be no mediator at this week's meeting in hopes that we can come to an agreement um, without the need and cost of a mediator. So we'll be meeting this Thursday at 5 o'clock at the CDC. Very good. Are there any questions of Nick? Yeah. Do you have any questions? It's better when someone's talking, please. Respect that. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, we can move on down to the finance report. Uh, we've had a, the finance committee has incorporated in its responsibilities buildings and grounds. And one of the things that we did at our last meeting was to go over some of the areas that were of concern to the administration as well as uh, concerns that have been expressed by the public and other members of the board. Um, what we, what we did and what I'd like to have your approval for is there are two minor <coughs> construction projects that really do not need to go out to bid that the committee recommended we bring before the board. Those two projects would be one to uh, rejuvenate the bathrooms outside the football field, the, the bathrooms that serve those, student, those uh, population that, that are visiting the games and everything else up there. If you take a look at it, it certainly needs to be done. And the second is to uh, build some steps at the middle school going down to the playing field next to where the football uh, stadium uh, goalposts are. If any of you have been there in wet weather, you'll find that you, it's very, very slippery to get down there. I've been told by our directors of buildings and grounds that the CDC is going to take an active role in revitalizing the bathrooms and um, we will just take a look at what we can do in terms of building the steps so that they are uh, appropriate for, for the situation that we find them in. Does anybody have any questions on those two projects? Leon, Fran, anybody else? Ron, was at that meeting? Did that just about cover those things? Yes, that's that. We need to give approval. Yeah, we do. One minute. Uh, but, uh, so I'll move to approve the two items for construction as soon as possible. Second. Uh, okay, it's, what's the money issue, or do we have to mention We don't have to because it okay. will be under the, the threshold, okay. which is $15,000. That, that's fine. Yeah. So we have, we have a motion on the floor to yes. move ahead with those two projects. Is the money budgeted? Even though we don't yeah. have to go out for bid. Well, we have a construction fund. We have a general facilities fund that we would uh, move around so that, that those funds became available to do it. Okay, we have a. Yes. I'm sorry, sorry. I might have missed it. I'm sorry, Dave. Go ahead. The steps, and what was the first one? The first one was I don't know if you're familiar with the bathrooms that are at the, at the field up there. Yeah. If you took a look at them, you'll see the doors are coming off the, the hinges and the walls need a need to be replaced and it just needs to be upgraded. And, and would this involve, and I just say this because I read the minutes, and maybe you just said it and I wasn't focused, but CDC uh, building trades. Yes, Paul, do you want to talk about that? Uh, 
Dave asked if the CDC was going to be involved in that. So for the overall building, the wood siding, the roof, uh, need to be replaced, repaired. At a, just a materials estimate uh, prepared for us by the CDC building trades class. Uh, have that in hand, and they would be prepared in the fall to do the work to do the replacement of those. The inside the bathrooms themselves that need repair items, that will be done between a combination of my own staff and some of the CDC. Very good. And you asked about the steps also? You're clear on the steps. Excuse me? You, you mentioned the steps. Yeah, the steps. Leon, would you like to explain that? You, you're more familiar with it than most of us. The, the steps outside, uh, what we had when we designed the fields, we put them in. We put steps in the middle uh, area, <clears throat> and then we have a gate that's right by between the end of the softball field and the uh, football field, but there's no steps there. People tend to come to the field look at the football field and they're visitor size normally and they try to go down the side of the bank and we needed to improve that area with uh, by placing steps there to prevent things from being unsafe and turn sliding down the side okay so we have a motion on the floor uh it's been seconded all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed or abstention the next project is, is a more major project. And in order to do this, we really have to get bids to come in. And um, what I'm looking for here is approval of the board to move forward with the project. Basically, the project is a renovation of the entryway and the um, administrative office space within the high school. The reasons for that, uh, <coughs> Steve really can explain them better than I. So Steve, would you just briefly go over the reasons for this? Uh... Sure. Uh, there's uh, one of the components is the main entryway. The way that the high school is situated now, when someone comes up to an outer door to get buzzed in, they, they get buzzed in and then they enter the school, but then they have to walk up to a window to sign in to actually get a visitor's pass to get into the school, which means technically once they get buzzed in the front door, they could go in another direction and be lost within the school because the two, the, the buzzing in and the checking in happen at two totally different locations. So one of the things that we're looking to do is to move the check-in office up to the front door. So when you come in, you will sort of be airlocked within the vestibule and there'll be a window connecting to the office in between the two sets of doors and you'll have to check in and be cleared prior to being buzzed into the into the school so technically we're doing all of our checking and our buzzing all external of the school before you're allowed in rather than doing it in two phases and on one side would be uh, for adults checking in and the other side would be for students checking in when they check in late. And the second part of the project is, I don't know how many of you can visualize or have seen the, the main office, but the main office is actually broken down into two components. There is the administrative component, and then there is a separate door which is mostly the security component and that's where the security staff is, and that leads straight up to Dave Barrio's office, who is the Dean of Students for Discipline. And for the last several years, culminating in my experience this year of seeing it, <clears throat> there is no separation between the two. And just to give you a quick example, uh, the week before vacation, we had a couple of incidents where when students get sent down from the classroom to the main office, they they come in either door. So they're coming in either through the discipline side or through the main office side. And we have parents, we have community members, we have parent and student meetings going on, and students act out on a regular basis. The walls that are around the security team are temporary walls. Uh, some students have knocked those over, knocked things off the shelf. We had a student who started swearing and getting angry. We had several meetings going on with parents at the time, and the student came out, broke a copy machine, 
knocked a hand dispenser off the wall, and did several hundred dollars worth of damage to one of the bathrooms. Long story short, we ha the way that the, the office is structured has not taken into consideration of how it's been used eventually. And it's not set up for, for discipline reasons. It's not set up legally to meet our legal obligations of how students are sort of housed, that we need adults to keep an eye on them when they're, when they're kept from moving from the area. We have issues with student and parent privacy because discussions are going on. The cameras that we use in the school, the computers that we uh, read the cameras off of are out in the open. So for insurance purposes, safety purposes, and uh, numerous other issues, we felt it's best if we were able to put up a wall to separate those two sections so there's a separate entrance just for security purposes for students. And we would be building a section into our <coughs> current conference room, which would be able to house the security team and have two areas where students can sit and still be monitored by the adults and a room where parents can sit down in privacy with a door and have discussions about discipline, suspensions, and things like that. So that's a brief overview of what the overall project would entail. We, uh, Paul had done some <clears throat> initial work with an architect to take a look at what could be done. What we need, as I mentioned earlier, we just need the approval of this board to move forward with that. The financing of it, unfortunately, we did not include this in the budgetary process as we are putting together our budget. But Renee and uh, Paul and others have worked together to find out, to find ways to postpone a few of the projects that we did have on, in our budget so that we would have funds theoretically to be able to complete this project. The original idea was, was far more extensive than, than what we're talking about now, but it looks as though, at least as on our first impression, that we will be able to afford to do it with the money that we will transfer from several projects that were already in the budget. Uh, and we would use, if we have to, if you remember correctly, what we did on the recommendation of the auditors, that our fund balance really was larger than it should have been. And we took a certain amount of money, about $150,000, and we put it into, let's just call it a contingency fund or a fund that we could uh, access if we found a situation that we needed to, uh, to deal with right away. This is not the consistent, this is not the fund that we had, the contingency fund that is part of the budget. That would remain there, we would not touch that. The money that we might have to touch would be that $150,000 that we put into a contingency fund uh, to make our fund balance more realistic. So the process that we would generally go through, or that we would go through, is that we would ask the architect to prepare plans, we would send out bids, when the bids come back, we would have a finance committee meeting, and the finance committee meeting would go over those bids and make a decision whether we could afford to move forward with the project. Does anybody have any questions on that? Yes. Dave. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dave. Uh, to check in, are there going to be two staff there? Did, did I, you said one was for students checking in late, the other one was for students people coming in. Is that to be two people there? Yep. They're doing two different jobs. The, the right. jobs currently exist. It's just that they're going to be moved to the front door. We, we have someone who is in charge of attendance, who does student attendance. So rather than sitting in the main office and not having contact with the students, moving them out by the front door, they would have contacts with students. So there we can deal with their attendance issues and whether or not there's any ramifications for it immediately. Plus, there, the two people would also be able to spell each other during lunchtime to make sure there's always someone by the door. And I have a couple of questions. One is, are are these two positions going to have the capability of locking down the school if, let's say they saw something as people were trying to, to log in, they ought to have that capability right there Yeah, once to do some, that? There, there's notification to the main office and where the police officers are, and the, 
whoever gets locked down for what, whatever reason, the doors aren't buzzed open, so the person cannot get into the school until that is clear. And okay. with the push of a button, they can notify the office, and the officer could be there in seconds. You also commented that we don't meet the legal requirements for the isolation of, of students that are in the discipline area. Can you <coughs> comment on those? Because I wasn't didn't know that there were any. Technically, if you if you have a student in place and you you restrict that student's movement, that student cannot be told that you you're in this room. You cannot leave this room without adult supervision. And okay. by restructuring it, that, that area where students would, when they get sent down to the office, if they're not being sent back to class, they can wait in this area with the security team right there. Right now, there isn't a place okay, out I there. Understand. And the places we use are the chairs out in the offices, and that's where we get disruption. Thank you. Yes, Dave. You're so is the, and I realize it's just still somewhat conceptual, but is the idea that uh, the, this new space would be between the outer door, the exterior doors and the, is there, an, is there an interior set of doors there? I'm having trouble picturing are, are you Are you talking about the, where, where the check-ins are? The, it, yes, yeah. yeah, sorry, yeah if, where the check-ins are. If you visualize the front doors, there, yeah. are, there are a double set of doors. Okay, yeah. But the way, the way it's operated now, the, the, the buzz-in system is only connected to the outer series of doors. So yeah. once you're in through those, there's a vestibule in the second uh, right. set of doors, yeah. but there's nothing there to restrict movement. Right. Right. No, so I, those I, second set of doors would then be locked on a buzzer system also. So uh -huh. once you're buzzed in, you're only buzzed in into the alcove between right. the two sets of doors. So, so the, 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 these, two, these two employees would be relocated essentially in, in newly constructed space between those two sets of doors? Yeah, the, 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 the person who does the buzzing in for the adults, yeah. if, I don't know if you've seen where uh, currently the, the person who does our scheduling and our data. Yeah. Uh, it's, if you're looking from the inside at the front doors, okay. it's the brick wall in the front. There's an office right there. Okay. So what we're planning on doing is to cut a hole in that brick uh -huh. facing the vestibule. And then that person would be there. The data person was going to move, they're going to swap spots. So they sort of okay. go into the main office and that person would be there. And so you would come in, be buzzed into the vestibule, deal with the window and the, you know, sort of like a bank teller situation. Yeah. And you'd have to sign in your background check and the whole bit, and then that person would then buzz them through the second set of doors. And stuff. Okay. I just want to say also, and um, I know this isn't probably a very popular position, but I, I, I've been concerned over the years, uh, just in the time that I've been on the board, the sort of the schools becoming more fortress-like um, mm -hmm. in, in an effort to keep them safer and the impact that that might have on, on students, um, but also the impact it has on the community's access to our schools. And we've, I've, I've mentioned this in the past, and so it won't come as a surprise to people on the board, but, but I do wonder whether there might be a place for some sort of community engagement as we continue in this direction and hear whether um, I'm the only one who shares that or has that concern or whether other people might have thoughts on it too. Um, I, I and, and I don't want to minimize the uh, concerns that staff might have or the, or the actual safety and security concerns which I know are documented, but I just wanted to throw that out there too so that um, if right, there is. The, the real emphasis, it certainly was part of security, but it also was the safety and the dealing with uh, disciplinary problems that, that led us to, um, to take the actions that we hope we can take. Leon, did you have something? Well, that's what I was going to say. We looked at uh, the plans to hold the group, the committee, and so forth, and the, the school climate and the environment, both the students and the staff, were looked at and considered in how to best make things flow and work to the benefit of the, of the student and the staff as well. And so by doing, making those changes in terms of the entry and separating out the areas so that the administrators will have a chance to do their work with students versus uh, when it comes to different disciplinary actions of people that are actually coming in and going one way, to make it a, a, a real bona fide effort to be iso not isolated, but be separated such that 
they can do their jobs and not be thinking or worrying about something else. So I, I think this is a, a real thing that, that needed to happen in the light of what's going on today in the day's world with students and the number of disciplinary referrals and all of the things we're trying to do, we're trying to separate and make those things out. So yeah, and, I would you know, strongly recommend that we uh, move in this uh, right. direction. I, I, I think I was thinking more of the, of the you know, entry right. uh, system. I, I think the other idea is a great idea, actually. Uh, I think it, it might actually be an improvement, I will say, over the star staring into a camera and not knowing you know, what you're looking at or who you're looking at now to get into the high school building, having a person to buzz you in, maybe that's an improvement. Very good. Dave, is that your hand? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you want to visualize this, Susie Falls has had this in place for the last several years. So when my kids were there, um, I went in and this is exactly what this room. Yeah, Dave, would you mind coming up to the oh, mic? Yes, sir. Just in case anybody in the. I don't think the mic's working, though. <laughs> no, we could hear you then, but okay. sometimes they can't I pick you up on the ca camera. Um, in Lucy Falls, they have, they've had this for several years. Where they have an enclosure. You come in the main, the main doors. Uh, there's a double set of doors. You're, you're there. Somebody in the office actually had there's a camera that goes in there. They see the person, and then they do the check, and they let you in. So if you, if you want to see it in place, yeah, you can go to Pusik Falls Central School. It's been there for a while. Thank you. Very good. Okay, so uh, we did have that. We need a motion just to continue uh, with the research into the feasibility of the construction project of the entryway to uh, the entryway and office space of, of the school. Now I'll move back ahead. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We also, during our, our tour, we had an opportunity to visit a few other areas within the high school, particularly, that needed attention. One is the exercise room, and, and um, I just am asking Paul to take a, take a good look at it, and if we have some funds, if we could put a window in or air, move some air or, or do something. But there are areas within the school that are heavily used that really need our attention. And the, and the emphasis of our recent meeting was to prioritize some of the things that we know that had to be done. And that doesn't mean that those things that we weren't able to put at the top of the list don't need to be done. But uh, we can only do so much. But uh, so I'm sort of <laughs> passing it on to Paul to see if he can do something for nothing in, the, in that exercise room. OK, any other? Discussions on that? Just want to say, yeah. I mean, one, I mean you, there's a list of items, but the main, some of the main things that we talked about, not only the exercise room, we talked about the wrestling room. Here. So, uh, just want to know, let everybody know there is a, a list and what it takes to do certain things, and all the details hadn't been uh, resolved into what could happen in those areas, but they are on a list to be looked at. So, they're not lost. And so it's a matter of trying to make sure that we find the funds to be able to apply to those things and improve them and, and move right on. And, that, and that's not a list that I expect to be multiple years away in terms of getting things done. Very good. We can move on then to the administrator's report. Steve, do you want to start with you? And why don't we wait till we get to the education uh, business before we talk about uh, what you envision. Did I see okay. a hand go up up there? Okay. I, I didn't hear you. That's part of my report, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. All right, so I'd like to start by, uh, we just spent the last six days at the high school uh, working on next year's schedule. And it's a laborious process, and I'd really like to thank all of those, uh, the people from, from guidance, uh, the guidance counselor, uh, Stephanie Peters from the CDC, uh, Christina Gabers, and uh, <coughs> Christopher Barnes for all the work. It's a fairly tedious job, but we, we actually finished loading all the courses today. And then it's a matter of just running it and to uh, make sure we don't have any additional conflicts that we weren't aware of. So just to let you know that the schedule is just about finished for next year. Uh, this morning, uh, 
I had the pleasure of being present when two members of the Berkshire Bank came to my office to announce to Aditi Patel, one of our students, that she was a recipient of a scholarship. And if you'll allow me, I would just like to read the first paragraph of the letter from the bank. Dear Ms. Patel, congratulations. We are pleased to inform you that you have been selected as one of our 2019 Next Gen Scholars. We received a record number of compelling applications that were re reviewed by a team of volunteer readers from Berkshire Bank, and yours stood out amongst some of the best individuals in your region. You have clearly demonstrated what community service and academic success are all about, and you should be proud of your achievement. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, Dee Dee said this morning that she is going to Brown University. Ooh, so, nice. very proud of Dee Dee, and if anyone sees her, congratulate her. On Sunday evening at Sacred Heart School, we had this year's National Honor Society induction. I believe we have a member here this evening. Oh, two members. And we had 18 new members inducted. So again, congratulations to those students, 18 new members into the National Honor Society. Also over vacation, uh, we had several staff members lead students on a trip to Europe, uh, and Lynn Sweet from our music department is here this evening, and uh, she has prepared a little presentation for you to give you highlights of what the trip to Europe was like with our students. Lynn? So my name is Lynn Sweet. I've been teaching in the SVSU for 23 years, hard to believe, um, and 13 years at the high school. And I have taken students all over on many, many trips uh, to Washington, D.C., New York City, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Uh, but I had never taken anyone in a plane, and I had never taken anyone to a different country. So I decided it was time. Um, so with the help of my colleague and friend, Dave Berrio, who connected me with the EF Tours, which is Education First, a travel company, uh, two years ago, I decided I'm going to go for it. If I can get six kids to join me, we're going to go to Europe. I was shocked and pleased to have 19 kids sign up. And oh, what, two weeks ago, or a week, whatever, I've lost track of the days, we left for um, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and France. So I'm going to add hundreds of pictures. I'm going to show you a bunch. And I have three students here that will just give you a little quick highlight of the things that they saw, did, experienced, and learned. Um, hopefully just a chance for you to see some of the really great kids at Mount Anthony and the great things that they are doing. This was a music trip because it was music students, but it was not a performance trip. So I, I didn't have my full choir or anything, although we did perform in any chance we got in cool places throughout. Countries. So, also on every trip, I um, at the end on the bus ride home or the plane ride in this case, I pass around a, note, a blank notebook and I ask the kids to write down their favorite memories. It's a personal thing for me, but I'm going to pass it around. You can just leaf through and see some of the highlights that the kids said from this experience. So, when I have music, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and France. We left on Friday, April 12th at 9 a.m. 19 students that were in grades 10 through 12. One college student who graduated last year but signed up for the trip last year and came along. Five adults, two parents, and three staff members. Myself, Dave Barrio, and Peggy Sauergadman, who is my paraprofessional with the chorus. That was our path from JFK to Frankfurt, Germany. And I would say over half of these students had never flown before and had certainly never flown across the ocean. Neither had I until last October on my first training tour for this experience. We arrived in Frankfurt, Germany. This was a picture I sent home to the parents to prove that we had made it. Uh, and then we were on a whirlwind for the next nine days. So again, I'm just gonna kind of fly through and at the end, there's a, a 
Facebook group that I created for the parents to keep them posted every day of all the things that we did. If you're interested, you can join that group and see daily pictures and all of the other things that we did. Heidelberg, Germany. Lots of castles, lots of uh, churches, palaces, lots of opportunity for great group shops. The European Parliament. Uh, Strasbourg, France was not on the original agenda, but our tour director said we could take a little detour, which was really wonderful to be able to add another country. Um, my only experience with this type of thing was Busch Gardens Europe. So having, getting a chance to see it all in, in person was really amazing. And for me to be able to see it through the kids' eyes was life-changing for me, really. Um, I'm hooked. This is the first of many trips now, I'm sure. Just lots of cheese, lots of uh, nougat. <laughs> uh, we passed through the Black Forest, which is no longer really a forest anymore, but that's in Freiburg. More churches. And of course, the Black Forest cake. Most of us got a chance to try that. We headed to Lucerne, Switzerland. Beautiful lion uh, sculpture in the background. You can tell it was chilly. It was snowing when we arrived, so we were feeling a little bit sad that we had left Vermont to go to someplace cold and snowy, but as the week progressed, we got, it got warmer. Um, in Lucerne, we took a uh, gondola, many of us, you all three did, right, to the top of Mount Pilatus. It was cloudy. I was disappointed. It felt like, well, this is just going to be a nice ride. And then we broke through the clouds, and there was an audible gasp that actually brought tears to my eyes, because my mm -hmm. students got to see this in person, and honestly, the pictures don't do it justice. That my students got to see that. It was amazing. The gondola, these are kind of little, but you know, these pictures, lots of pictures of the kids. Again, I have hundreds of pictures that you can see on our Facebook page. Coming back down from the top of the um, of Mount Pilatus, this was the view because the sky was starting to clear. Uh, and then Lucerne, if, you, if you've never been or if you ever have a chance, it's probably one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen mountains and swans and just amazing. We had a great Swiss folklore evening where the kids got to do all sorts of fun uh, traditional Swiss games. Swiss music, fondue, fun pictures, <coughs> dress up, great, lots of music all throughout the trip. Um, quick stop at Liechtenstein, again gorgeous, things we've never seen before. Then we went to another additional thing on our tour, which is the Highline 179, 1,322 foot suspension bridge, 374 feet high. Many of these kids were afraid of heights. They conquered their fear. Again, the pictures don't do it justice, but that was very, very high up and very far across. Right? Yes. A little scary. <laughs> How many flights of stairs did you climb to get there? Oh, like 90 something. 90s, yeah. yeah. That was yeah. a hike. Yeah. Does so it fit. sway? Does it sway? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you can feel people walk. And you can, yeah. <laughs> um, next up was the gorgeous and amazing Neuschwanstein Castle. Again, things I had only seen in books and, you know, movies. Stunning. And again, the view coming from the top, from Neuschwanstein Castle, looking down on other castles. We just don't have things like this in America. So, um, another many, many churches. This was a beautiful church in, Vi in Bavaria. The outside looks rather plain, but the inside was extremely ornate and gorgeous. Everybody was looking up everywhere they went. Next day, we spent some time at Dachau concentration camp. That was a very different experience, very sobering. Um, the students took it very seriously. I would say that all throughout the whole trip, their behavior was excellent. I was so proud to have them along. That's the gate entering Dachau. What does it remember <coughs> what that means? The work will set you free. Work will set you free. Schloss Park, Nymphenburg, Munich, Germany, another gorgeous palace. That was the whole group. We were combined with another group of students from Pennsylvania, um, and that was good and bad. 
certainly good because we got to meet new kids, bad because their chaperones had very different expectations than ours did. Um, but our students were amazing under the circumstances, which were mostly good, but we did have a few issues. Um, Rothhaus Glockenspiel and Marienplatz, Munich, Germany. That's where, if you've ever been, there's a beautiful clock tower where, um, on the hour, there's an elaborate display of um, uh, what are they like puppetry kind of thing that go around. Uh, lots of live musicians all around. Almost done. Thank you for your patience. We took public transportation, which was a little scary for me to make sure I had all my kids with me all the time to the University of Munich to learn about the White Rose Resistance. That was another extra that our tour director gave us. Um, there we are on the subway. White Rose Resistance display. And we went to an ice cream place afterwards that had very unusual flavors. I tried guacamole. A lot of the kids tried white asparagus flavored ice cream, and they said it was very good. So. Salzburg, probably one of my favorite places, of course, where The Sound of Music was filmed, and also Mozart's birthplace. That's the abbey where um, Maria actually lived before she went to uh, the Von Trapp house. That's the fountain where Maria splashes in the water, if you remember from the movie. Uh, that's the statue of Mozart with all the kids. They did a little singing of some Mozart music in front of that statue. Gardens, palaces. These were the steps where the, the Von Trapp children sing Doe Deer, and our kids actually did perform that there as well. That was very fun. And then, probably one of the highlights of the whole trip was a private dance class where they learned the Viennese waltz in Vienna in a gorgeous ballroom with two wonderful instructors. And at the end, they all got a certificate saying that they had received instruction on the waltz and the polka. And just to wrap it up, here's uh, oops. a little bit of a demo. <laughs> and then they did teach them a little bit of the polka. They'd be happy to teach you if you'd like. <laughs> this up. If you want to see all of many of the other pictures, you can join our Facebook group, which all the parents had access to throughout the trip, so they knew exactly where their kids had been. And uh, now I'm just going to ask you three to come up and just say your favorite highlights, the things that you enjoyed the most, if you're ready. Erica is a senior. Erica, where are you going to college? I'm going to the University of the Arts in Philadelphia for acting. And Rachel? I'm going to SUNY Potsdam in Potsdam, New York for theater. And Carson is a sophomore, so we'll give him some time before he makes that decision. <laughs> so I'm Erica Scholes. I'm a senior. And uh, traveling is one of my passions. I've been fortunate enough to do a few abroad trips with my mother over the years. But this trip gave me an opportunity to go to places that I've not been and places where like, my, lots of members of my family haven't been, including my mom, who's well-traveled. Um, but I'm a big history buff, so on top of being able to be in all these places where Mozart grew up and Beethoven and all this musical influence throughout history, I have been able to apply my knowledge from world and AP Euro and US history in these places that we're traveling. So I love the opportunity to be in Vienna and visit the palace that the Habsburgs lived in and see New Schwanstein Castle where Ludwig II uh, went crazy, they say, and like, things like that. So I appreciate the opportunity that Miss Sweet gave us to like, not only apply my music love and passion, but also uh, knowledge from my other classes. <laughs> 
Oh, hi, my name is Rachel Langlois. I'm also a senior at Man Anthony Union High School. And unlike Erica, this was my second time leaving the United States. Um, first time flying overseas and first time flying. Great experience. Um, I do love history, but I'm, I'm not a history buff like you. I just like enjoying history. I, I'm like a nature buff, and I love making connections with people. So going to um, Europe with another school was very exciting, except for when things didn't go so great, but that's, that's fine. Um, but um, our tour guide introduced us to some new games. Um, she has this special way to play Uno, which was extremely fun. And then this one game called Holly Golly, which is a German game, and it's one of my favorite games in the universe now. A lot of explaining to do. <laughs> Not enough time. But yeah, it was an experience that I'll never forget, and I'm extremely thankful for it. And I couldn't have asked for anything more. I'm Carson Gordon. I'm a sophomore. Uh, some of my highlights were definitely the Swiss Alps. That was probably the peak of my tour. No pun intended. Um, um, we were going up the gondola, and it was like got really foggy. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, we're not going to see anything. And then all you see is completely blue skies and these beautiful peaked mountains. That was definitely a highlight. Um, another highlight was uh, Switzerland. Very beautiful city. Very expensive city. Overall, the uh, trip was amazing. A life. Um, lifelong memories. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It sounds like a marvelous trip, and we're all appreciative of, of what you did to pull it all together and everything else. Do any board members have any questions of either the students or uh, anybody else involved? I just yeah. echo yours, Lynn. Thanks for taking the time and effort to do that. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank it you. was a pleasure. Like I said, they were. Uh, I had the best students for sure at Mount Anthony in the chorus and the band and music department. Um, Just a practical question: sure. the finances of it. Were you able to help those students that may have a difficult time coming up with the bucks? So it's expensive, and I told the kids that right from the beginning, which is why I really thought if I could get six kids to go, that meant that I could pull this off, and I truly did not expect to get more than that. Um, I don't know how the parents did it. And the, uh, what I tried to do, because on, on top of your um, trip cost, your package cost, which was, if you signed up early two years ago, it was about 3400 If you signed up a little later, it went up to 36 38 And on top of that, they're spending money, which they spend a lot of money, parents. <laughs> um, and we also have to pay for the bus transportation to and from the school and gratuities and all that so that it, it starts to really add up um, I did work really hard with the students last this past year to try to raise money to help with the bus cost we were able through the British invasion to raise enough money to pay for a school bus to and from the airport um, which was great I think next year we next time we would try for a coach because the school bus was pretty bumpy on the way home um, but for me, long term, I would love to figure out a way to, to a, create a scholarship because there, I have so many students that could never afford this, not even close, that would benefit from an experience like this. Um, and I'll just say I know some school districts, um, my best friend does this, and her school board pays for the, the bus to and from the airport. So <laughs> I'll come back next year and say, <laughs> want to help us out. But again, some sort of scholarship would be is something that we need to establish for so many of our kids that would never be able to afford it otherwise. Well, it's, it's great. Ed. I have one thought, and it might be belong in a committee level, but there have been a lot of instances in Europe this year, particularly France, where something like 800 churches have either been vandalized or, or fires started and so forth. And I've wondered if we need some kind of security protocol where somebody, before they actually get on the plane and leave, are making a check with the State Department or, or whoever has knowledge of, of whether or not an area is safe to go to on, on that day. Well, and it ought to be part of the protocol of, of making certainly the something, trip. Something. Dave? Uh, to Ed's point, that's one of the reasons why we go th with EF Tours. They do all that for us. They go through, they, they go through the U.S. Uh, government about what's what's safe what's not then the tours are set up so we go to the safest parts of the town so 
that's already built into this company. Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to say very quickly is, you know, we hear about some of the, the, the kids acting up at school. If you could see the kids on the trip, you would get a whole different impression. I mean, on our bus, and, and I know Lynn alluded to it, it was like it was an invisible wall. Our kids sat in the first part of the bus listening, you know, to everything the tour guide said. The group from the back, and actually their chaperones sat in front, the group in the back talked through a lot of what was being said. At nighttime, our kids were in their room. We had bed, we had bedroom checks. The other kids, you could hear them on the hallway. So a marked difference between the kids from Mount Anthony and the other school. And that's been my experience in the 22 trips I've taken with EF or with Mount Anthony kids. That if you want to see our kids doing the right things, some of the activities like this really show it. Well, that's good. And a lot of that has to do with the trip leaders and, and everybody else. So once again, they did a super job, I'm sure. <laughs> Anybody else have comments? I hear you. Well, I, I just wanted to, you, you alluded to the, the question and you talked about it, the availability of students. And uh, what we, when we started and designed the program to allow all these things to happen, we wanted to make sure that no students were excluded that wanted to go. And, and you put a lot of emphasis on cost and expenses and them not being able to uh, afford to go. But what as students, that wanted to go, that didn't go because of costs along that line. We need to work on that part for the next time coming up. If we're going to offer a trip like this, and we say that it's tied to the classroom, to the curriculum, and so forth, that ways to try to raise money, or uh, the school to chip in some money along that line, and the results to be uh, tabulated the way you did it uh, here in this report, but I, I hate to see students excluded to be part of a class, a part of an organization, and don't go because they don't have the money. So just just so that it's clear, when I like within the music department, we take at least one trip every year. We have a small trip and a big trip, um, and we we do a ton of fundraising. And if there's ever a kid that wants to go, and that's that trip is usually between four and five hundred dollars. I figure out a way for that kid to go. This particular trip was something outside the scope of the chorus or the band. It was it was an opportunity for music kids that might want to. So um, we do work very hard to try to make sure that kids have opportunities to travel at least within the U.S. This was my first experience with a with a trip of this size. So I certainly have thoughts of trying figuring out ways to get kids who can't afford it to have the opportunity if they are willing to work for it and um, you know help fundraise and that kind of thing. Very good. Are there any other questions? Well, Lynn, thank you. I'm thank you very much. Everybody. Great job. How do we turn this off? Uh, we're not, oh, we're still using oh, it, Tim. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you had asked a, a yes. meeting or so ago that Nancy represent the guidance department to give you a quick overview of what the guidance department does to prepare students for college right. acceptance and uh, scholarships and those type of things. So Nancy is here to give you an overview of that. Hi. Hello. I'm sorry if I stand so annoying. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm here to discuss various opportunities that the high school um, promotes for our students, particularly with the accounting department promotes. Um, so we concentrate heavily on students entering multiple, all, or one of these fields, our pathways. The students, we focus on college, career, or military. Where we begin is we start with the students not even in our building yet. We start by um, physically going to the middle school. We meet with our students individually, our incoming students individually on one-on-one -on -one meetings. We have a, a field trip where the eighth graders come to the high school and they have a tour of the CDC, all of the different programs that we offer, and then they come over to the MAE side and they have a presentation by the school counselors, and then the National Honor Society students do a small tour of the Emmy, uh, Mount Anthony's building in groups of maybe 10. Um, 
the course catalog is also given to the students at that time to bring it home, share with their parents, start planning what they want to take in the high school. Students start meeting with the middle school and um, they might implement that into their PLP. And then, so before they come to the high school, they have a general idea as to what the meeting is about. Um, so freshman year, after they leave the middle school, we have a freshman orientation night. The first day of school, as you know, uh, for the past few years, has only been designated to freshmen so that they can feel comfortable uh, without the upperclassmen there, have a better understanding of the building itself, better understanding of their schedule. Um, they also begin that first day working on their personalized learning plans. Uh, they have the ability that the freshman year to take introductory classes at the Career Development Center. Uh, we continue with one-on-one -on -one individual, individual meetings. And um, students can also start applying for VSAC. Students are interested in continuing their education beyond high school. Sophomore year, all students are um, required to attend a sophomore summit. They continue in introductory classes if they were unable to fit in freshman year. We again, one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, they continue working with VSAC, and then students are allowed at that point in time to start taking introduction to college studies over at CCD, and they earn a half a credit on the level, and that's more of an exposure as to what different pathways would be, that pathways would be for them after high school. So junior year starts to really ramp up. Um, our students at this point in time have a better understanding, they're more mature, they're able to now take full programs at the CDC. They, um, we started implementing um, uh, manufacturing field trips. So our students go on these little field trips to Mac Molding, NSK, um, came in composites, and they start to see what that would be like. So we're looking at trying to build our community as well. Um, we have a Hudson Valley uh, Community College field trip that occurs in September. We start doing presentations with our students. Um, college representatives are coming one-on-one, -on -one, meeting with students in small groups. And last year, I think we had over 60 college reps come and meet with students who wanted to um, hear more about like, what the college is about. Uh, they can also do dual enrollment classes. So Students are allowed two free college courses um, while they're enrolled in high school. And then we have the crop, the, we just had a college fair actually, and it was a success. And the reality fair, and then in May, we're going to, the school council will be presenting in small groups um, to our juniors the next step that they need to take preparing for senior year. Um, so senior year, once again, they continue with college representatives and one-on-one one -on -one or small groups that continue that is from September till December. Um, every week, we have the department leader. We have Aaron Dickey and Sean Warren that come and meet with students individually. They help them build resumes. They help them find a job. They help them do post-secondary planning. Um, we also have, once a week, we have um, Sergeant Mike Mark Slade from um, National Guard. He comes and meets with students, helps them prepare for the ASVAB, gives them a better direction as to what each of the branches are about. Um, he doesn't do a recruiting thing, he does an informational. He'll meet with the student and the parents multiple times. Um, we have uh, yeah, seniors and juniors, they, they sort of um, intermingle a little bit because they're both uh, allowed to come up without the field trips. The ASVAB exam is given in November, the manufacturing field trip, college fair, individual meetings. Um, so senior year is really about, in, especially in the fall, applications, applying to colleges, scholarships, financial aid, um, and then after that it's hopefully graduate, supporting them graduation. So the counseling office in regards to scholarships and financial aid, um, Monda Kelly works with VSAC. She's been coming to Mount, a uh, Mount Anthony for several years now. She meets with students starting from freshman year on. She'll take on students even in their senior year if we need her assistance. Um, she helps them apply for the VSAC grant and scholarships. She helps them apply for FAFSA. We, all, we also access Martha Canfield from CCD. She's also employed by VSAC. 
NCRA came in the fall and um, they had a financial aid representative that came for a parent night and did a whole presentation about how to apply for financial aid. In our counseling office, there is a scholarship board. So as scholarships come in, there is um, deadline, application, how to apply. The counselors reach out to the students. We also are not not Canadians, which is a it's like a way of communicating to our community, but also it's a way for students to apply to college. There is daily emails that are sent to the parents and the student with an update of, hey, this is a new scholarship, this is how you apply, this is when it's due, see your counselor. Um, and then also teacher and counselors do recommendations and they do nominations for various scholarships that come out. What is the ASBAB exam? Um, that's the Armed Service Attitude Vocational Battery Exam. Oh. Yeah. So I want to find out what they're going to push you. And, and <laughs> I'm taking notes. Okay. Whoops. It's free. They didn't even call it that. But oh, okay. And the math scores, I'm not familiar with that effort in either. So math testing is what? Measures of academic progress. Measures of academic progress. It's NWEA uh, as the company and the district has been um, uh, has been giving them for a math language usage and reading for the last uh, uh, 14 years. It, it plots growth measurement for students. It takes two points in time. We use winter to winter and it shows the, the student growth over that time period. I get it. Thank you. In, in terms of uh, preparing for the SATs and things, is there any uh, effort made to help students uh, so they can do as well as they can on those tests? Yes, so um, CCD has been doing an ACT and SAT prep course at our school upstairs in the library. And do we give the, the students uh, some type of realization as to uh, where they would likely be accepted? In other words, if we have a student that we know is extremely capable or something like that, that's not a problem. But if we have a student that is marginal, uh, what do we do with that student to make his or her expectations realistic in terms of colleges? So students that, you mean students that may have a 1.2 GPA? Well, whatever, just uh, rather well, than treating everybody at the same, in other words, do we make an effort to, to have students apply to colleges where they stand a realistic chance of getting in as well as doing well once they get there. Absolutely. We have 27% uh, of our students start at two-year colleges. And so that's where those students would typically fall. Um, we don't discourage them from small, applying to smaller four-year schools. Um, and that's normally where we encourage them and we help prepare them. You know, we need to do a college uh, visitation, you have to reach out to the admissions counselor, you need to set up an interview, and you need to really show that you are interested, that this, that your transcript is not a true reflection of your ability, and we work on explaining why. And that usually comes in their essay, every student will have to like, submit an essay, and so hopefully they will take that into consideration. But if not, they will start out in a two-year school. What do we do about students that, that we feel would really go do better going into the trades? In other words, you know, the CDC or something, making it available to them so that they can do something rather than going to a little large college or something like that. Do we do we encourage that? And, and yes, we have students that um, are, that's why we, we did the manufacturing field trip. We have been trying to recruit students to do the um, CDC courses at night. Um, Rob, I think Robert Bainey, um, he's been, he came over to the counseling office, met with all the counselors, explained what options they have. Um, and then we, I just had two students last May who went through the LMA program at night and are both working in the community and are looking at signing up with SDMC to finish their bachelor's degree or even start their bachelor's degree and not have any loans taken out. So we do try to help students as much as we can access trade schools. Speaking of the CDC, is there, would there be any value if the state law was changed so that they could start a two-year program, say in the sophomore year, instead of waiting until they're a junior? 
Um, so recently I had a parent who inquired about having her freshman daughter start. And I mean, I don't know what the, the law was, but basically when I reached out to the CEC, they, they had to start at the age of 16, and it, it was a law, but it, yeah, well, you're looking at changing that. I don't, I don't well, know I, an answer for that. I know it's been proposed at different times, but I've been off duty, but it never, never gained any traction. And I was just looking for your input from your experience with the kids. Some of them would benefit if they could enter a two-year CDC program and sophomore instead of waiting for their junior. I think if the student is passionate enough, then it's, a, it's available to them and that's what they want to do for a lifelong career. Okay, thank you. You need to have the enrichment classes that sort of get them oriented yeah. in the direction that they want to go in before they <clears throat> actually establish a career path. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So to think back off of that, they like if, if you wanted to do auto, you have to have at least some algebra underneath your belt. Right. But same with building trades. You need to be able to have the mathematical background to make sure you're rushing it. So I think that's why they usually wait a couple of years. Uh, the dual enrollment question. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Keep rolling, Leon. I'm next. Oh, all right. Well, you can, I can. <laughs> I'll, I'll let that one go ahead. You're going to go eventually. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go back later and say my order changed. I mean, is there a check, check, check? That a student will be able to access it themselves. Or any of their guidance counselors. Yeah. I have students that see me every day. But I'm asking, is there a minimum? In other words, does the guidance counselor say, I haven't seen Joe Smith, da 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 da, and in other words, could I switch you and never see my guidance counselor? No, because we meet with our students every single year individually to pick out four selections to meet with them to review the LPs. Okay. And then we also do small groups in every seminar. So I don't think that would be possible. Very good. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions? There are all sorts of things. It would be interesting to have a when the college acceptances come in to get an idea of where kids are going and uh, thank you Dan. okay Leo. Well, I, the dual enrollment it seemed to me and and that's right dual enrollment is not just local ccb can they yes. do it with other colleges out there yes. online and whatever along that line yes yeah, so we have students at um williams Bennington college as you see um and then we also have uh, students that do online classes like with UVM. That's the dual enrollment. Right. And the only place that offers money is not just VSAC alone. And I see VSAC is heavily mm -hmm. stated in here. They got a monopoly on the money that they loan students. Mm -hmm. uh, other, other avenues are out here for students to uh, qualify for a certain type of money. Where do they get that from? Well, through the scholarships. <coughs> They, that, that money is listed under the scholarship so right. program. So if I'm not looking for a scholarship, but I want to borrow some money, because VSAC mm -hmm. is not just giving big scholarships uh, money. So they Cooper give Kelly has. That's right. And that's what I wanted to know, that there are other finance groups out there, mm -hmm. like Cooper Kelly and some others that offer students money. And while we were really honing in on VSAC as much Right. Well, I mentioned these that because they're, they're present in our um, building to assist, but I recently met with Amy Carey, who is now working with um, Owen Scott, and I'm also on the board for Cooper Kelly, and so this counselors, we heavily promote those two um, companies to do either interest-free or very low interest rating loans. Right. Um, back on the, uh, the part of field trips and, and I think they mentioned something like, we have a lot of students that are not really abstract college students. They're not going to be teachers or they're not going to be professors. They're going to be hands-on people. Mm -hmm. And we strongly encourage a lot of those as they take field trips, uh, field study programs. And we have a field study uh, department area so that they have an opportunity to go out and visit those or do a paper or something. I, I just think that that area is one that could probably be 
it's really enlightened to have a lot of students do a, a diverse review of a lot of different areas of interest and of possible interest before they make a final decision because I see them as that. Once they get graduate and they say, well, you know, I really don't like that. You know, I'm not successful at that. But if they had multiple chances for field trips, field studies, or documentation of those studies through the program that we have in place, uh, I think we'll be more successful in that area. I agree wholeheartedly. One of the biggest issues is that transportation. A lot of these students don't have a vehicle to access anything beyond walking to the of Pennington. So, if we wanted a student to have a true experience in an internship, there would be transportation issues. We could increase that by giving them all license. <laughs> <laughs> that program. And a car. Great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. We do appreciate it. We look forward to hearing how they come up this do. Thank you. Okay. Well, we'll continue with this. I see that Amy is here so that we can go into education. But uh, why don't we finish? Steve, I'm sorry. Do you yeah, have I'm, anything I'm, before we go on to? No, uh, that was it. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Ms. No, no. Uh, oh. Mr. McGuire. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Middle school. Um, I just have a few brief things that I'll, I'll touch upon, and then I didn't. I'm sorry. I don't have any uh, uh, students or fun things with me today. Just boring old me. So I apologize about that. I'll uh, get that on the back for next time. But. Um, and then uh, Mr. Payne, I think that, uh, you know, asked me to uh, come and discuss uh, something that uh, was added at the Education Committee. Uh, we can go into that. But uh, we, continue, uh, we, we worked a lot last year to revamp our schedule to, uh, to uh, create an intervention block so students could get uh, interventions that they need in reading and mathematics without missing their first instruction in their core classes and their unified offerings. Um, so we've we've uh, done a lot of screen. We've been working very closely with a literacy coach for the last two years. Um, has helped us make a ton of progress with just getting uh, the right student in front of the right teacher and uh, making sure that that fits into their schedule and the schedule doesn't uh, impact uh, you, know, you know impact what they need. Um, so we've we've gone through the process of uh, you know screening students for the different targeted interventions that we have, and uh, we're offering uh, well over uh, you know 100 inter I don't have the exact number, but well over 100 interventions for uh, three main reading programs that we focus on uh, here in the building for uh, that that address both uh, comprehension and uh, uh, decoding needs. Um, so that's uh, one thing uh, we've uh, uh, re-looked at our staffing assignments just for teams. Uh, you know just with with new hires and um, you know retirees and stuff like that, just making sure that we have a good balance of of uh, you know different teaching staff on each team in the building, um, so that is ready to roll out. Um, and then I guess one of the the biggest things we've just wrapping up our first year of full implementation of standard space grading, uh, as you all know. Um, so I've uh, led a committee uh, that worked on a staff handbook last year uh, for the standard space grading. Uh, we've met again uh, a handful of times throughout this spring, uh, winter into spring, and uh, just kind of uh, re-looked at the handbook, um, you know, just made any revisions as necessary to kind of reflect that, you know, what, what's happening and where we're at. Um, and uh, one of the big topics of discussion right now is just honing in the, the plan for uh, the summer. Uh, you know, I, I hesitate to use the word failure because in a standards-based uh, grading system, you know, there really is an opportunity for failure. Students cannot show evidence, but you know, you, you keep at it, you keep at it, and eventually, you know, uh, through you know redos, retakes, remediation, they're able to show evidence. So we're looking at what summer. Uh, historically, we've had summer school. You know, if you fail a class, you come summer school and, and take that class. So we're looking at uh, a whole new structure for summer school this year. Not any difference with uh, staffing or anything like that, but just how we're working with students. Because uh, if a student is not meeting the standard for one uh, <coughs> domain in English, for example, they probably don't need to come for the f you know the four weeks of summer school. Once they are able to you know have some practice opportunities and show evidence for that domain, then then they're good. Um, so we've just been doing a lot of work on what that looks like for students and, and how we can make sure that students have an opportunity to, uh, to show evidence for all the domains on the report card. Well, that's great. Any questions uh, about the, uh, concerning the middle schools? Leon? Uh, I'm concerned myself about those kids that are, uh, are not meeting the standards mm -hmm. because what we said was going to happen that we were going to either be 
offering an additional uh, out of the classroom, bringing back in to make sure that those students get caught up to get whatever they're missing mm -hmm. so that they can be mainstream of that. I don't know how we're keeping track of those kind of things along that line in terms of the number of students that are not being proficient and the type of help that they got. But I, uh, if, if we're worried about summer school, something that's not happening the way I think it ought to be happening inside of the school, that's all. I can comment on that. I mean, just, you know, historically, we, we, every year we have summer school. Um, and, you know, I'll just say again, instead of looking at it as, you know, a student has failed a class, you know, they, they might have some domains in any given content area where they haven't shown evidence for meeting the standard. It could be various reasons. It could be an attendance, you know, attendance issue. Um, it could be the student is, is, you know, actually struggling. You're right, there are times built into our school day where they can work on showing evidence as well. Um, you know, we have these various intervention classes. Some students have a team time block. Some students have a study hall. At the end of the day, this is a, another support in place for students to provide them with an opportunity to, to get to where they need to be to, to be successful at the next grade. And, and ultimately to avoid retention, as we all have seen the, you know, the data on retention and how that can be really pretty detrimental to, um, you know, uh, staying in school and finishing high school. Very good. Any other <clears throat> any other questions? Amy, we can move on okay. to education. Uh, the committee met on Tuesday, April 23rd last week. Um, and I have a couple of specific items to go over with the full board. Um, first, Mr. Payne presented a proposal for an additional sixth grade science teacher. And I'll go through some of the details. Currently, there are two sixth grade teams. Each team has two teachers who each cover two subjects. The incoming sixth grade class, so the current fifth grade class, is going to be 15% 15, 15 larger than in recent years, from around a current 130 this year to about 150 students next year. With the current structure of two teachers per team, class sizes would be uh, what is Mr. Payne deems is, and is commonly understood to be too big at 25 per class. There's precedent for adding an additional teacher in uh, the 2012-2013 school year when sixth grade enrollment was around 150. Uh, Mr. Mr. Payne has proposed hiring one science teacher. So each of the five teachers, each teacher would teach either English, science, or math, um, and then all five teachers would cover, would cover social studies. The financial impact is identified in the paperwork in your packet, and the administration feels comfortable that this position can be funded out of the current FY20 budget. And the Education Committee voted unanimously to support the proposal and re recommend its implementation to the full board. Very good. I can continue well, on, or? Well, one thing that I'd like to add is that I think we also had a discussion of the certification of that person that we're looking to hire. Mm -hmm. In other words, it would be advantageous to have some to have somebody hired that not only could teach in the sixth grade, but also could work in the seventh and eighth grade. Mr. Payne talked about that it could be a K through six um, certification. Ideally, it would be a five through nine certification so that there's room, there's latitude later to move around. But the message I think the uh, committee received was that that's an ideal situation and K through six would also be acceptable for him. Any so, questions? So this person's job description will be the same as yes. currently there. Yes, correct. Right. Yeah, you can see. Um, no, I'm right. okay. doing a good job. I don't understand the presidents of the number of students uh, that you mentioned in terms of uh, so, the, the can I come 25. Yeah. Yeah, I've got the um, no, I have it. It's good. Okay. Um, so, uh, the only, uh, thank you, Amy, but the only, uh, the only small correction was that there, it's, and this might answer your question, that's the reason I'm saying it. There's actually, it's not two teams of two teachers, it's one team of four teachers and one team of two teachers. So there's six teachers currently. So that's where you get your 100, 150 students. If you divided that by six, you'd have your 25, 25 students in a class. That's correct, and that's why I'm wondering why we're throwing the number out there. When we do, we group them all together. And I, I, I'm trying to think. Yep. The teachers are, are being, the students are not being exposed to just one teacher at one time, right? Separately by 25. And so it behooves me to know whether we are trying to, well, we're adding on another number 
in terms of a, of a class size policy piece as opposed to the need in the classroom or the activities that you just spoke to yeah. in terms of the additional help that you need outside to be able to manage those classes. And I'm trying to find out where we need to put that, that those emphasis as opposed to just adding another teacher on to say I got, you know, six of teachers for a block or six graders just because I got it. Or I got six graders and I got an A over here that are now catching all <coughs> these things that we're not able to get. No matter how many teachers I got in that block, I'm still going to need that help somewhere. So the, so the teacher would be talk about it that way. Yep. So it'd be a science teacher hired to join the two person team and make a three person team. And as Amy indicated, the, the teachers that are currently on that team would all pick up a section of social studies. And then you have your math, your science, your and your uh, and your English teacher on the team. The three this is this would be the science teacher added to the team. So that's what that's what the request is. And that would lower the numbers of class sizes for everyone because one team, you know, you could have 85 or 90 on the four-person team, and then you'd have, you know, 60 or 65 on the three-person team, and that would put your numbers down to around the 21 number opposed to the 25. It's unprecedented that we would ever ha that we ever had uh, the 25 in the sixth grade. So what are we gaining from that? And student performance and activities, what I'm trying to get at, out of that, not the president's of what's in the seventh and eighth grade of this, and now saying I want to make the sixth that way I want to know we're having students come into the middle school that we're saying that need some additional work or whatever to become a true middle school whether it be discipline or academics meeting the standards or something along that line as opposed to saying, I want you guys to just go ahead and standardize six, seven, and eighth graders, and I want to have a uniform number of teachers for them, no matter what the needs are. I'm not sure I understand the question. I, we're, what, what, our goal here is to limit the class size. That's so right. we have less students in the class because we feel that you know the teachers are are, are not going to you know it's it's going to be a more much more difficult task to educate mm -hmm. students with the, the higher class size. So That's what the right. class sizes are, and I'm talking coming in outside. We brought the sixth graders into yeah. the other schools that have the classes, the, the teachers. I mean the classes, sixth graders. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether we asked about their class sizes and so forth and what we're doing with those. Yeah, I. Out there. I'm not sure that I don't have the numbers for for the other schools current class sizes like of the fifth graders coming in but I, I do know that when you look at uh, do you have that? Uh, Mr. Payne told us that um, it's heavy in the BSD the current fifth graders right but that Shaftesbury Woodford and Pownall don't have um, it's not going to translate to the seventh and eighth grade years so the income, when the other three schools come in as seventh graders, it's not that same large bubble that the BSD is providing in that cohort. In the sixth grade? Yeah. Along that line. Right. Yeah, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to figure out what we get. I mean, I, I, I'll repeat this. I'm looking at standardization of the number of teachers in the seventh and eighth graders for the blocks, for the building groups, <coughs> as opposed to uh, normally, the elementary <coughs> carry larger numbers than the high school in terms of students per class and so forth. They do that. But then I'm looking to see whether we, you, you're adding, I want to know what kind of additional help the students are going to be getting in the sixth grade as opposed to just having a, a, a less than, having 25 or 20 or, or 15 in a class. Well, I think by you, by you adding this, I mean, what I've taken away from it is by adding this teacher, you're simply maintaining the educational model that the current sixth graders are getting That's and correct. that the, all, the sixth graders have gotten for how many years? I mean, I have back through 2000. Well, since before Mr. Bain is yeah, I mean, here. I would say since I was in sixth grade. This is what they had to do when the numbers bubble up like this. <laughs> And that's what happened in the 2012-2013 year. Uh, another, uh, an additional teacher was hired because it was a, the same number as we're going to have next year. It was all around 150. That's what the projection is. That's what, what we are going to be at for next year. Um, and uh, an additional 
teacher was hired for that school. Yet. Because otherwise, you're 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 that's, landing with four. That's, that's exactly why I'm questioning what we would do, what, and that, and we can go on, and we'll be able to do this. But what I'm trying to do is stop. Uh, I mean, think outside the box, question whether we need the teacher or we need an aide when you talk about support in a new standard, of making the standards, beating them, I mean, needing additional help, whether we say we want to bring it in as an aide or whether we want to just have low numbers in the classroom and we still got to have an aide. That's but, all. But an aide can only teach in the one, you know, only, uh, they would only, it's only one person. So, I mean, you could put an aide in one of the class, but you're still going to have 25 students well, in all the classes. An alternative classes. area for support of the class. That's all. I, I mean, it's, I just, I, I'm questioning the standardization and stuff along that line. Yes, we've done that in the past, and I keep questioning why we're trying to do numbers when we have them in a house and so forth. And so I'm asking the same questions I asked for the last two or three years along that line. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we just brought it up. Very good. Does anybody else have a, have a question concerning the, the uh, proposal? I, I want to I thank Mr. McGuire, Mr. Payne, and everyone else that's, that actually has their expertise in this, who's making the determination that this is something that's necessary. And uh, I, I appreciate the hard work you put into that. Right. Thank you. It, 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 particularly with dealing with, with kids that age, when they've got an emotional problem coming in from an elementary school, there's a lot of social adjustment to coming into a new environment, a new way of teaching, a new thing. So it certainly, it is academic, but it also, it also to have that personal relationship, a close personal relationship between the teacher and the kid makes that transition just that much easier. Go ahead. Did they find the funding internally already without yes. adding to the, right. the cost? That was found? That's yes. on the proposal, yeah. right? Right. That we brought. So just speaking to the sixth grade class sizes at the other elementary schools, they know Shaftesbury's is not 25, it's you know 23 typically in a, in a busy year, and I, I don't know what Powell or Woodford is, but um, there's, I mean, we've also moved, it's been, a, a, enough time has passed from the time this building opened that most of us don't even remember, and I'm not sure that I even remember, but the part of the reason that it was a sixth through eighth grade middle school was I think to incorporate sixth graders into a middle school model, whatever that might mean to yeah, you. Yeah, the teaming structure. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure that we have that as opposed to the sixth grade is in a wing that happens to be in this building, but it's not necessarily using the same model. But uh, it does make me wonder about the average class size or the student teacher ratios for seventh graders. And, and whether that's, does it jump dramatically when you move from sixth to seventh grade? Our, uh, what I will say is our, our um, current um, seventh grade class has large class sizes because our eighth grade class is really large. So we have one team, I, I know this is, at, you know, going on nine at night, this is a little much, but um, our eighth grade, uh, we, t we have one team in the school that's typically split seventh and eighth grade. They, they teach seventh and eighth grade. Um, and usually the seventh and eighth grade are very similar in numbers. And so, you know, that splitting that team with seventh and eighth graders keeps it even. Um, the, our eighth grade class is very large this year, around 240 students, or seventh grade to about 200. So we had to make that team a full eighth grade team. So that helped our eighth grade numbers a lot, you know, brought it down to around 20. But our seventh grade numbers, you know, were impacted and they're 25. Uh, a good 25, solid 25, 26 in a class. So that is uh, what we're trying to avoid. Okay. Because it, uh, you know, I don't feel that that's, uh, you know, educationally sound to have that class size. And I know, I think Mr. Payne feels the same. Thank you. Are there any other? Well, it, I just wanted to, sixth graders coming in, we, we didn't bring them in to be seven, like the seven and eighth grade. We housed them in this building here for BSD, and, and they, they've not got the same. They don't change classes of teachers of whatever along the seventh and eighth grade do. They're actually very, uh, I would say they are, uh, we're a six, seven, and eight middle school. So they, uh, they follow the, the same model as the seventh and eighth grade. They're set up in teams, they're organized in houses, they attend unified classes. Um, they're, we're a middle school, six through eight. Okay. 
Okay. And so the last comment, this, this number of worrying about the 25, uh, we need to be aware of that as a board when it comes to the high school and you start looking at these numbers. Because now we're saying, here's a, here's a big number, think about the number the other way. That's all. I, I think <laughs> the message I got from Mr. Payne is that that evens out in the seventh and eighth grade years, that the incoming, the, the <coughs> current fifth graders from the non-BSD schools aren't as large as the BSD schools, That's so correct. that it evens out in the seventh and eighth grade. But, but it is something that we all should take a, take a good look at as those kids move on through the schools that we've got the staff to handle. So anyway, is anybody else, any other questions on this particular issue? If not, I would accept the motion. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Dave, or Dave, do you second? Very good, any further discussion? Just, I just wanted to just make one last follow-up comment and just to one of Leon's points and just uh, they do the sixth grade does also have access to the intervention classes and all of that that I was discussing so when you talked about like the extra support for them and making sure that you know they're, they're getting the we're not just giving another you know another person that they're, they're getting support they need to, to show evidence to meet the standards and to close that you know achievement gap they have the same access to all of our literacy interventions and math interventions in the building um, so that's not inequitable. They have the same access to seventh and eighth graders for that. Okay. We have, yep. we have a motion on the floor. <coughs> Further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All with your attentions. Very good. Carry okay. on through. Hopefully All right. I, I won't get this next part without any mistakes. Okay. Mr. Nixon proposed wonderful. the creation of the director of guidance position at the high school. This position would provide oversight and administration of the guidance department staff and will replace an existing vacant guidance counselor position. This, position, this position's contract would exist outside of the three SVSU union bargaining agreements. The position existed previously. Since its elimination, the guidance staff has carried administrative duties. The creation of this position would relieve the counselors of those duties, allowing them to focus more directly on their caseloads. The director would have a reduced caseload. This would be a year-round position, and the director would be available for evening engagements with parents, creating increased visibility and support mechanisms for students and families. Furthermore, and importantly, the director would have the ability and responsibility to review staff. This has been lacking in the guidance department in the absence of a director. The financial impact is expected to be covered in the existing FY20 budget. The Education Committee supports the proposal and recommends to the full board its approval and implementation unanimously. Very good. Just, just to review it, we do not have a Director of Guidance right now. We did have one and we changed it to, to not have it for various reasons. And now we've received a recommendation from the principal <coughs> to go back to a full-time director. The advantage of a full-time director is that he or she can do evaluations, can, can do that. Also, that is not uh, based on a per diem um, assignment during the summer. There's a good deal of work to do during the summer. And with the system that we have now, for everything over the contractual agreements with the teacher, it has to be reimbursed to the, uh, to the, to the guidance counselor to do the work in the summer and the evening and, and all that sort of thing. So there's a, there's a lot of it, uh, advantages uh, to, to it. Steve, would you like to add anything to what Amy said? No, that, that's basically everything that's in the proposal covers the position. Um, one of the things that we're trying to implement next year is uh, individual class nights. Uh, so have nights for freshman parents, then have a night for sophomore parents. So the way that you were able to see how the process works towards graduation and then what happens after graduation, we would be doing this with parents. One thing that, that we hear on a regular basis is parents may start to pay attention to college in junior year and not realize that GPA and grades in freshman year and sophomore year are just as important. Uh, also to find out what their opportunities are, what it's like, especially first time parents with high schoolers, of, of what they need to do with sophomore parents, how they need to prepare. And so that's a huge part of it, is that connectivity with parents. 
And we also have the testing, don't we? Doesn't this, wouldn't, would this individual be in charge of the testing program? This, this person would then bring all, all of the standardized testing we do in the building, be it MAP testing, SBAC testing, SATs, all of that, and bring it within the guidance department. It's, it's many faceted. Uh, Leon, I'm sure you've got a question yet. Yeah. Uh, I thought I read something in the notes that says that the guidance members of the department had not been evaluated in over 10 years. And maybe I'm, I'm not clear on that, but we said when we changed that system over that certain people at the high school was going to be responsible for evaluating the guidance department members. And so they shouldn't have gone you know, 10 years without an evaluation. I, if that's in the notes somewhere, I think I'm out of read. That's not true. Unless somebody didn't do what they were supposed to have done. When we come and say we're having people do their jobs and evaluate people and put programs in place and we change things around, we ask certain questions of who's going to do the evaluation? Where's the job description? We ask those questions. And so somebody didn't follow through on it, and we didn't ask the questions of the board as to whether those, those individuals are getting evaluation, if that's the case. I'm in favor of putting our head in the, the, uh, the guidance department to make sure we have a one person, not maybe multiple people doing the evaluation of the, of the team of people in that area so we can be more productive. But we just didn't do what we said we were going to do way back. Any, any further questions? Mm -hmm. Tim? Yes, I'm sorry. Both you and Leon have mentioned um, that the head was, there used to be the position of the head, and then it was taken away for right. various reasons. It was reasons. a reorganization of the guidance department. Mm -hmm. At the time, we had a new principal coming in. Okay. And she felt, and legitimately so, uh, that there were reasons, and the board went to the board, voted for it. It was her suggestion, and the board voted for it. And um, uh, this was two principals ago. Right. Okay. And now we've, and now we've got a, a new Understood. principal, and, and um, he's made a very strong argument for reestablishing a, a head of guidance. Yes. And, the, and the administration was organized differently back then. Yes, right, it was. Any further questions? The yes, state, to complete your, the answer, the state wouldn't permit a person to be a, a union employee and do evaluations. So it never moved forward because of that. And now we're solving that problem by making this person part of the administration. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay, we have a motion, please. Right So, second. Do we have any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Very good, it passes that. Thank you. We have one more piece of business. Let's go back to the uh, consent agenda. Tim, can I just finish up? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to finish up our meeting by our request. Mr. Payne presented to the committee an overview of the daily schedule of the middle school. That's something I wanted to go over with him. Um, and our takeaways are, and this is all nuts and bolts, but good just to hear it. Uh, there are three, I'm sorry, there are seven 42-minute academic instructional blocks, four days per week. On Wednesdays, there are three, there are seven 33-minute academic instructional blocks. We had a conversation with Mr. Payne about how he felt about that duration, um, and he, you know, says that ideally an instructional period would be closer to 50 minutes. So then we started talking about things like length of day, and you know, it's just spitballing. But we talked about how sports are important and impact that, and obviously contract negotiate the contract um, constraints. Um, so that's something that we talked about, and I think it's just important for all of us to kind of circle back on, on the nuts and bolts of, of the academic day. Um, he noted that he and the staff, um, as Mr. McGuire said, are always working with the schedule. And uh, Mr. Payne noted the importance of non-educational blocks, such as advisory and the time created by shorter blocks on Wednesdays for community <laughs> building and cross-grade uh, programming. Um, and then, just real quick, I'll just talk about that the committee talked about goal setting for the coming year. Um, and the educational committee will schedule meetings as individual 
issues such as the two issues tonight come up so that it, we can field the information and present it to the uh, to the full board and we will schedule two uh, immediate in the near future we're going to schedule two meetings to look at specific issues in August we're going uh, the administration is going to present and we'll have an opportunity to review and explore um, with the administration graduation requirements that's in August and then in September or October we're going to do the same thing with a um, under, uh, with a review of MAU's science curriculum. So I'd encourage you all to try and attend those meetings if you can. Hopefully they'll be informative for right. all of us. Steve, was that the time frame that you felt was going to be in the science that we were going to wait wait that long for? Yeah, ju we were just going to review the the curriculum, and I asked uh, I asked the the head teacher from the science department to attend the meeting whenever you're ready to to have them okay. and to go over uh, not only what the curriculum is currently but what the projected curriculum is and where we're planning on going. Okay. Mm -hmm. For which, uh, we got the, the position that, that yes, yeah. you do. Steve, you have a, uh, Leon is just asking me about a uh, job description for the science Position. No, for the guidance here. Mm -hmm. I mean, guidance here. Yeah, we wanted to make sure we asked for all of those to make sure they're out. Yeah, I think we, we gave that out. That's out, right? I believe we gave that out. Yeah. One thing that, just to enlarge what, what Amy was saying, is that during the meeting there was some interest uh, expressed in, in our science uh, curriculum, really. And are we really up to date in what we are offering and what we are encouraging the students to participate in? Everything from robotics to engineering to higher degrees of math and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, so one of the things that I personally am very interested in is seeing that we take a good look at that curriculum to be sure that we are meeting the needs of the 20th century. Anyway, any other questions on that? Okay, if not, we'll go on to the consent agenda. Did you do it before? I moved it. I'll move it again. <laughs> we have a second. We get a second on that. Second. Second it. Okay. Any discussions on the consent agenda? If there are not, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Very good. It passes. Uh, the superintendent um, was unable to make the meeting. He had a personal situation that he felt he had to to. Uh, to attend to, which he was 100% right in doing. I have no no uh, report for the chair's re report. And I'd like to thank those people that have put in the last month or so a lot of time. Yes, David, right there. Uh, uh, two things. One, can we send Tim Foley a letter of thanks if you read the banner this morning? Uh, he's done all these plays and such. And uh, two, can we ask Jim when he comes back if he's going to tell us how our communication person is harvesting all the good news. Have we got a plan in place? Very good, I will do that. I can answer the second one. SBSU, we just presented, and it's on CAT TV, all of the things that they are. They a great plan in, in place for the communication person as a, um, for all of the school districts. And so you may want to take a look at that video in which Carson uh, present it to uh, SPSU or you may want to have him come here and present that same type of scenario so it was great uh, to have him come and display all of the things that are trying to get into place for a communication uh, 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 it's coordinator Good. I'll, I'll take a look at that Dave <coughs> to, to simplify the the way it's going to work Every building has a principal who will be the point person providing information to the communications coordinator and there will be a, an alternate person appointed to fill that task when the principal is, is too busy or not available. So the information is going to be flowing up to the communications coordinator who will then make sure that it's disseminated as needed and appropriate. Very good. Is that good? Run. I thought maybe if he could go to a faculty meeting and tell all the uh, all the faculty 
here's some of the things I'd like you to let me know about. Sure. And they'd see him and know well, what he's I, about. I, I think we had to see Justin, what, what was a good one? We'll ask him to come to our next meeting. I'll see if Jim would uh, go along with that and you can direct some of those questions directly to him. Okay. Good. Uh, Ron, did you pick up what uh, Dave was saying? Yes. Kind of what, what, and you two will communicate. I'd like to thank Ron and Karen for the work that they did in sending out the letters that you had requested at our last meeting to be sent out. They were sent out. And uh, Amy is, is working on the, uh, those, those teachers that are leaving that have had a substantial longevity within the school. We'll be more on that, more on that later. Any other issues that should be brought before the board? We, we did have a policy, the SDSU policy meeting, and we talked about co-curricular activities, and we had all the administrators there and, and board members uh, along that line. We didn't get a chance to finish that policy, and it'll be probably on for the next month or two, talking about all the things that need to happen in terms of that area. That's all. Very good. Are there any other items that should be brought before the board? If not, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Second it? Second. <laughs> All in favor. Thank you very much.